Hello, welcome to the Gender Equality Academy webinar series. Um, my name is Vasya Madesi and I'm the project coordinator of G Academy. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome you from my home office, from actually my actual office, an actual setting. I'm very used to saying home office uh, in Thessaloniki in today's webinar. Before we start today uh, with uh, the webinar generating high quality data for designing and implementing gender equality measures in your institution and introduction to the gender equality audit and monitoring tool workshops, uh, I would like to give you a very brief introduction of what GE Academy is about. So, uh, what GE Academy is all about. We are starting from the fact that there is a challenge out there. There are many gender equality programs, projects, and a great gained knowledge. But at the same time, we realize that there is actually a large difference between uh, research performing organizations in various countries, while there is a small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with the theoretical and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. So G Academy is a project which is funded by the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program, which develops and implements a high quality capacity building program on gender equality in research, innovation, and higher education. And this webinar is part of this program. Our training offer uh, used to include uh, in-person training and interactive participatory workshops, but now we are mainly working with online training sessions, which are still highly interactive. Interactive webinars as this uh, very one, summer schools that will be online and uh, the deadline to submit your application has been extended. So if you're interested, you, can, you may still join us. Uh, train the trainer sessions and an open collaborative online course, which will be available later on this year. We are a consortium of partners all over Europe with a strong experience in coordination and management and a strong experience in developing training methods and materials um, in general. So today's webinar and the agenda will be presented by uh, Smart Venice. This is just a small overview of it, but I would like to let you know that this is only an introductory webinar and we are actually organizing follow-up sessions, uh, which are interactive online workshops, uh, with the first one on the 11th of May, which is uh, still an intro to the tool, and two follow-up uh, workshops, which can be found on the website for registration. So you may also find us on YouTube channel. Uh, we have the channel Gender Equality Academy EU, where we upload all the sessions and this uh, very one as well. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please uh, let us know your thoughts via live tweeting because we're doing that. Uh, follow us there and uh, thank you very much. I will give the floor now to Natasha and Maria from Smart Venice to tell you more about today's webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Vasya, uh, for your uh, introduction. Let me share my screen as well, if you can see it. Hopefully, yep. Uh, so, um, as, as Vasya, I mean, I'm, I'm here with, um, with my colleague, Natasha Sega. Uh, we are from uh, Smart Venice, a partner of the um, GIA Academy project in charge of the learning component of the, uh, of the program, as well as the um, uh, evaluation of the uh, training offer. Um, we have thought of um, um, a, a G Academy webinar series as a way uh, to really make um, uh, as many as possible good practices, examples, uh, knowledge and tools available uh, to a wider uh, audience in a, in a very compact way, but still uh, trying to uh, keep it interactive. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, organized 12 webinars um, uh, on several topics. We have extensively collaborated with uh, sister projects on institutional uh, change in gender equality. Clearly, with the uh, impact of the pandemic, um, uh, we have experienced in GIA Academy um, 
in, in a way um, a, a process where uh, the, the different um, programs uh, have started being a bit hybrid uh, as all the other formats um, have been uh, going online as well. Uh, but uh, still the, the, the webinars are, let's say, the introductory and compact part. Uh, Today, uh, we um, want to provide you with, an, uh, with a short overview of the GIA, uh, gender equality audit and monitoring um, tool, the GM tool, uh, presenting um, its purposes, uh, features, availability. And this is clearly an introductory webinar uh, for those who are considering to join uh, the three forthcoming uh, hands-on online workshops uh, that, where, where participants will be guided uh, to really use and customize the, the, the GM tool um, and adapt it to, to their own organization. Uh, so today we want to really clarify all questions and doubts about what you are going to experience uh, in the um, active learning um, workshops um, that Vasia has already introduced. And um, the keynote for, for today, helping us in doing so, will be your Müller, as you know, from FUOC in Spain. Uh, so um, the, the agenda is, is quite uh, brief. Um, we are going to have um, uh, a presentation from uh, Jörg uh, of about 15 minutes. Um, a Q and A uh, session of the same uh, duration, and then we will be able to uh, to wrap up and conclude um, the session by noon. Um, I know that we are all really <laughs> familiar with all sorts of platforms these days, but uh, just a quick um, uh, slide to recommend you to uh, post your questions to the uh, speakers uh, using uh, the Q&A button, uh, while uh, to use the chat box to communicate uh, with, the others, with the other attendees, but also to let us know about any technical issues. Um, and uh, also to stress that uh, you, you can start um, uh, typing your question, questions in the Q&A uh, box uh, even um, during the presentation. So why we have um, decided to uh, focus through uh, um, a webinar first and then um, uh, um, an online uh, workshop on the topic of generating high quality data. Um, as I guess you are, most of you are familiar with the concept of institutional change and um, uh, the GEAR uh, toolkit uh, from the European Institute for Gender Equality, uh, you, uh, you know about the main steps of institutional change. Uh, and uh, you are probably aware of how um, really uh, analyzing and assessing um, the internal state of play at each organization is one of the uh, initial um, steps in the, in the uh, institutional uh, change process, um, along with um, then uh, setting up the gender equality plan and implementing it. Uh, after that, um, high quality data becomes uh, become again very much relevant throughout the monitoring uh, progress and evaluation uh, phases of the JEPS. So uh, what we are going to uh, present you today and in the online workshops uh, is highly relevant for two uh, steps uh, of the, um, of the uh, institutional change uh, process. The analysis one, the audit one, and the monitoring and evaluation one. Uh, this should also uh, support um, research organizations in uh, meeting the new Horizon Europe requirement that uh, the European Commission uh, has now uh, approved uh, for all uh, applicants to um, the, the uh, calls for proposals within Horizon Europe. So um, the, the, the key building blocks, so-called building blocks that uh, each um, research organization applying for funds uh, should be able to uh, comply with are um, 
also including uh, data collection and monitoring. Uh, in this regard, sex disaggregated data collection across all staff categories uh, will be uh, requested, um, as well as uh, an annual reporting of gender imbalances across job categories and leadership positions. And it's also foreseen that uh, research organizations undergo uh, a comprehensive evaluation approach. So uh, as you see, um, we also fit into this, uh, let's say, new um, development in terms of policies from the European Commission. Uh, so um, this is why we really thought that um, the proposal from uh, from FOC uh, to uh, to present the GM uh, tool uh, was really on time, uh, particularly because uh, we really believe that uh, it's very important and useful uh, to rely on um, tools which are already uh, tested and uh, validated and not to uh, each time have to reinvent the wheel. And this is the case for the GM uh, tool, in fact. Uh, so um, I am uh, just now uh, ready to give the floor to uh, our speaker, uh, Jörg Müller, uh, who is uh, a senior researcher at the uh, Internet Interdisciplinary Institute of um, uh, the Free University in Catalonia, in Barcelona, uh, part of the Gender and ICT program and coordinator of uh, several um, EU-funded projects on gender and science. You might know about Genport, uh, GEDI, and uh, the ACT uh, community of practices, uh, in, in which uh, this, um, the DM tool uh, has been uh, developed. So um, thank you um, for your attention. And uh, Jörg, please, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Maria, and uh, thank you, Lasia, for this uh, introduction. Um, uh, it's really nice to have this opportunity uh, together with the Gender Academy to present uh, some of the work we did of uh, the ACT project, uh, particularly, of course, uh, the Gender Equality Audit and Monitoring Tool, uh, which I want to give you a very brief overview um, today. So let me just share my screen. you you should see now my powerpoint yeah okay so uh as maria mentioned uh the gm has been developed has been worked functioning now for three years. It's, been, it's a pretty uh, big consortium um, composed basically of uh, seed partners, which are underlined in the slide you see. Uh, those are the partners who currently coordinate uh, different communities of practice. So these are differently distributed. Uh, some of them are, have more a regional focus, for example, in Eastern Europe um, or in, in, in Northern Europe as well. Others are more thematically focused, so they are practice uh, for the life science, for physics, but also for specific topics such as uh, gender budgeting. And the other partners uh, in the project basically have supported the communities of practice and uh, developed several tools and, and guides. And one of these is uh, the gender equality audit and monitoring tool, the GAM, which I want to present you today. So within the ACT um, project, basically the GAM has been developed by three partners. This is on the one hand, Advanced HA from the UK. Uh, it's Notus uh, here, which is um, a small agency of applied social science research with Maria Caprile. And then it's our team at the Open University of Catalonia. Uh, it's myself and Zarzianes. So we have basically uh, contributed to it, but there's also a lot of effort now ongoing or has been ongoing re regarding the translation of the GAM. You can see there are several translations already available. 
uh, in Portuguese, in Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian. There's also a Spanish version. And right now we are working uh, actually on the uh, translation for, for Italian for, and for Greek. So it's, it's quite, you know, uh, it's quite a solid effort behind also already uh, providing a version that you can use in uh, these different languages. Now, what, what is the basic idea behind uh, the JAM? As Maria said, and I think this is really key, don't reinvent the wheel. So there have been many uh, structural change projects financed by the European Commission. And I think the big majority of these um, projects have done a gender equality survey at the start uh, of the gap implementation, the gap design process, where you do your initial audit. And uh, so the problem we see with this is that often uh, as these gender equality plans are implemented in research performing organizations where there is not necessarily social scientists, but it could be, I don't know, a life science or engineering, uh, there's little experience with uh, how you do really a good survey. So you can put together a certain, you know, questions and, um, and uh, send out the survey and you will get some data back, but it's not necessarily, uh, the data you receive is not necessarily good quality. So um, this was our starting point. And what we try to do is basically to review uh, existing questionnaires that exist for this initial gender equality audit in organizations. We also did a literature review on uh, what measurement scales exist for certain uh, constructs as well. Put this together and then used as well the Athena Survey for Science, Engineering and Technology uh, questionnaire. This was developed in 2016 and even before by uh, advanced HE in the UK. Also, this was a survey developed particular to, uh, um, well, survey uh, the perception and experiences of people working in STEM in universities in the UK. So we took this as our basis together with the other existing questionnaires and then designed a new one, which we validated within the consortium with this very focus groups and then also uh, by actually um, implementing it in, in different organizations, uh, member organizations of our communities of practice. And this should enable you in the end to really get uh, high quality data, uh, which you can use for designing your gender equality plan, but also then evaluating or, or, or monitoring progress, let's say. Uh, all this the entry point for the GAM is on this website. You can see here it's gam.actongender.eu. This is where we have um, the documentation for the GAM. And it's also where you have the instructions of how to apply for an account and so on and so forth. So that is this is really the entry point. Um, the GAM survey, it's, it's a survey as its name says, it usually is one element uh, of a whole battery of means to um, get data during the initial stage of your gap design. So I'm sure uh, you, in order to design a gender equality plan, you will talk to your human resource department in order to get, you know, the data of promotion, of recruitment, you know, the gender distribution across staff categories. If you're lucky, you will even get uh, information on the wages and the salaries. Um, this is mainly quantitative data. You know, you can also map the stakeholders where you're uh, of your organization or department with whom you're usually uh, discussing matters of, uh, you know, gender equality or career progression. Uh, then you will probably do a text and image analysis, you know, the politics of job announcements. You will do interviews certainly with academics and people affected, student managers and have a couple of focus groups. Um, the GAM survey covers a specific area there where you want to learn more about the perceptions and experiences of um, the employees, the staff in, in, in the organization. So if you want to reach, if you want to go beyond 
the interviews and the focus groups and really have uh, ideally a representative sample of what people perceive where there might be problems in terms of gender equality or if there are experiences on sexual harassment, for example. Uh, you, if you don't have a protocol, if you don't have a JEP in place, it, it's going to be very difficult to, you know, get this data otherwise, if not through a specifically designed survey. Just want to make also put um, clarify because there's a certain confusion between what we understand as qualitative data and what we understand as quantitative data. A GAM survey for us produces quantitative data because there are uh, certain measurement scales which you can uh, treat uh, either categorically or numerically. And this is different from qualitative data where we usually understand, you know, interviews, interviews that you can transcribe then and you work with a text that you analyze, categorize. And I mean, there are different strategies to really work with this. Okay. Because sometimes there's also confusion that human resources, this is the quantitative data and everything rest is qualitative. No, we understand as far as numerical, it's quantitative data. So we have integrated uh, several components in the GAM. Uh, you see there's a split between the GAM core and additional modules. So I want to concentrate first on the GAM core, um, where we have integrated, of course, a section on sociodemographic variables. Uh, and we ask about age, gender, uh, the ethnic minority status, sexual orientation, if there's a transgender history, uh, any disabilities, uh, marital status, and educational level. So these are the basic socio-demographic um, variables that we ask that in the end, in combination with the responses to any of the other sections, of course, you can conduct um, an intersectional analysis. So for example, how age and gender correspond to career progression, of course. Uh, then there is a important section on the working conditions. So where we ask about, you know, the characteristics of the current job, your position in the organization, experiences and opportunities of training, work-life balance, of course, uh, including parental leave, policies and support measures, job satisfaction. And we also integrated a new module on the impact of COVID. Um, Another section is on organizational culture and climate, where we ask about the perceptions of uh, gender equality. If people think, you know, there's a preferential treatment between uh, men and women, um, the recruitment experiences, but also to what degree they perceive um, their working climate inside the organization to be, to be particularly masculine, which implies be very competitive, you know, where it, the importance lies on, on strength and stamina and so on and so forth. And then we have a final section on interpersonal behavior, where we ask about microaggressions related to the usual dimension of social dis discrimination. So for example, ethnic minority status, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. And uh, about uh, sexual harassment, experiences of sexual harassment and the opportunities for reporting any incidences. Then we have, there are additional modules uh, which can be, which exist, let's say in the online platform and which can be easily added uh, if there is any, uh, you know, room in the questionnaire. As the overall, the game is quite long. Let's say it like this. It takes about now in the second version between 20 and uh, 30 minutes to fill it out. So, but if there is room or if you have uh, specific interests, for example, in beliefs, in bias, um, there are additional models that can be uh, connected. Coming back to what Maria said in the end, so this is are the typical four phases when you uh, plan a gender equality plan and implement it. So typically when you would use the GAM is during the initial stage, the analysis, the audit, when you collect your data, but also then when it comes to the monitoring. And the idea is since we have measurement scales and uh, items that have been tested, you should be able to attribute any observed change to some of the measures or con uh, to some of the measures that you implemented. 
instead of you know not being sure if the change you detect now is because your measurement instrument really doesn't work or because it's any of the measures you you implemented let me tell you also very briefly uh, a little bit about the overall infrastructure when we talk about the uh, GAM, it's really uh, it's 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 a combination of several tools so on the one hand you have the GAM questionnaire which we have implemented in the Lime survey platform, which is online. So it already exists as an online questionnaire. You don't have to, you know, start using SurveyMonkey or Google Forms or whatever and copy it from paper to the online format. It already it's online. Um, basically, when you apply for an account, we create a copy of the existing questionnaire for you. You customize it as you see these different universities have done. So you add specific items you need in your organization, new questions, you delete the ones you don't want. And then basically you're ready to launch uh, the survey in your organization. Once the survey is finished, we have prepared a reporting template, which basically what it does, <clears throat> sorry, uh, it generates the descriptive statistics from your data. So it generates, you know, the graphics, the usual graphics and the frequency tables. And uh, you are can pretty quickly after the finishing of your survey, you, you have an overview of how your data looks. And then of course, you will start questioning the results, interpreting the results, which then comes at the next step. So what are the main take home points? It's uh, the GAM is uh, free to use, it's online. Uh, you, it will save you a lot of time in, in developing and reporting uh, a questionnaire because it's already set there, has been tested, it's there, it's ready to use. You can adapt and customize it. And then once you launch the survey, the data you generate, it's basically you're the person responsible for your data. Uh, you have to sign an agreement with us that uh, once we create the account for you, the responsibility of the data, also what this implies in terms of uh, data protection and privacy, it's really up to you then. We can help you with some of the things like generate the report, but also the whole thing is set up uh, in, uh, that uh, all the scripts, everything is available for you. If you want to use it and can use it, uh, that's, that's perfect then. Um, but still, I mean, it doesn't save you, let's say, from really then in the end, look at the data, interpret, make sense of it in the context of your organizations and design from that the specific measures that uh, make sense for your gender equality plan. <clears throat> I think I better start here because my voice. Um, And uh, yeah, this was a quick overview of uh, the gear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg, for uh, this um, introduction and presentation of the GAM tool. Uh, I see that there are already questions from our participants. I think they are all very interested in dis discover it and discover it more. So. Um, um, I will uh, start with the question of uh, Giovanna, uh, who is asking if is it possible to download the data and then analyze them further in the SPSS? Yeah, there is an export module in Lime Survey. I mean, we are basically bound to uh, the technical features of Lime Survey. So if you go to the Lime Survey manual and, and, and page, you see all the uh, technical features that are available. Uh, there is an export um, to SPSS, that's correct. It seems like there are small issues with the labeling, but in principle, yes, you, you, you are able to export it to SPSS, to Excel, uh, and all the scripts that we are using and we provide are in R. Thank you, Jorg. And I 
would like to also ask a question that actually comes from the registration form of our participants, from our, one of our participants, who is asking what share of the staff response could be considered as a representative sample of the whole institution? I mean, approximately. This, is, this goes into the statistics, right? I mean, you you have to first, if you want to have a representative sample, you have to decide if you want to catch the different staff categories, for example. Uh, then you can't say really it's a certain percentage because it depends on the statistical power you want for your tests. So um, there's no easy there's no easy question, but. Uh, um, there's no easy answer, sorry. Um, but I think from what we've seen, we've been positively surprised actually from the response rate uh, in the institutions that the GM has been implemented so far. Uh, given that we did the version one, which even was longer than the version two, it took about you know 40 minutes to 50 minutes to fill it out. There was actually quite a high response rate. So for example, I think one of the best response rate was in the case of uh, Poland with uh, 500 responses, full responses of the questionnaire. So this is already quite good, I think. And uh, also some feedback in along these lines was that actually the response rate was quite good or, or people were willing to respond because, you know, it made a quite solid impression on them. So it's like, you know, um, if I respond to that, the data will be good, and uh, there's probably something coming back from that. This was another feedback that we had. But depending really on, you know, what would be a good response rate, you would need to look, you know, the size of your institution, and then really, you know, what you want to cover and and what statistical power you want to achieve in your test. There's sure. a formula for that, but I can't remember cite you that now. Sure. And Giovanna is asking also if the questionnaire is made just for academics or also for administrative staff as well. And if it is possible to add your own demographic data, for instance, uh, making the difference between administrative and technical stuff. There is one question where we separate uh, between uh, administrative staff, uh, technical support staff and uh, researchers. This is like a, a very basic distinctions that we took over from the OECD manual, basically. Um, you can, of course, and you actually have to add your own uh, question regarding the different staff categories and roles you want to cover in your organization. So since this depends on every organization, it's just the skeleton of this question there, which you have to fill in yourself uh, when you customize the questionnaire. Um, what, what, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Uh, if there is um, the possibility to add demographic data, so making difference between administrative and technical stuff, but I think uh, you, yeah, no, you. Exactly. Um, I mean, the GAM is geared mainly for academic stuff, but many items also apply to um, administrative stuff. There are no specific questions for administrative stuff, if this is what you refer to, but in the same way that there might be a parental leave policy or measures available for administrative staff and researchers, so this applies equally. Uh, the measure on uh, job satisfaction applies equally. The measure on um, masculinity contest culture that we've included, this applies equally. So there are many questions that are quite generic in this sense. If there's any question you have in mind specifically for your administrative stuff, then you have to uh, add this. You should add it. Um, Lime survey also permits, if you want to, to include this in the customization and it's a little bit more technical, you can then uh, steal the flow of your responses. So show certain content and questions only to the administrative stuff and the other two to the researchers. So this is also then a possibility you can, you can introduce. Okay, thank you. Um, I will run because I see that there are many other questions. So I will uh, now um, tell you the one from Jana, who is asking uh, um, 
whether there is any good practice when it comes to the balance between qualitative and quantitative data, so to get a balanced picture of for a JEP. Oh well, well, this is I think this is a very it's a very good, very good, very general question in the sense that I mean you have to have qualitative data when you start designing your JEP because there might be issues that you don't cover with a standardized questionnaire so first you talk to people to understand the situation and then usually you try to do a questionnaire where you incorporate some of these insights and try to see you know how general is this problem really is this just an isolated experience of someone or is this really you know quite common and and and, and a bigger problem in my in in, in my organization um so I think it's a combination of two. You, you can't really, each, each has very specific purpose, what you want to know, and you use the instrument that is best, best designed for that. So one is qualitative data. You have to talk to people. And then it's the quantitative, the questionnaire. If you want to see, well, is this really something bigger, shared, common? Where should I prioritize no? in my gender equality plan, the measures, if there's if I see, you know, this is shared by everybody, but then I probably need to do something in terms of awareness raising or, or a specific, I don't know, protocol that needs to be implemented. Yes, indeed. Very general question and also difficult to give a specific answer on this, but uh, thank you for, for your response and thank you, Jana, for asking it. And in the um, the game also has some open text questions where people, mm. where we ask about, well, what other suggestions do you have or things like that? So there are also these open text questions, but then it gets, of course, tricky in analyzing this because you have to read each one. Yes. Uh, let's go now to two um, a bit more specific question on the GAM tool. So Dorte is asking if the survey is available only in English. I think you you said it, but it's good to, to repeat what other languages are available. And Nicolò is asking if it is possible to use not all the core questionnaires, so all the 65 questions, but just some modules or questions uh, specific. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's available in, in, in other languages. So far it's uh, German, Portuguese, Spanish. Um... Hang on. It's, it's on the website. <laughs> I can't, you can't remember all the, it's Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian, sorry, exactly. And currently um, it's going to be translated also to Greek and French and uh, Italian. And uh, yeah. And regarding once, basically the, the way it works, we create the count, the co uh, an account for you, which contains the copy. And with a copy, you can do whatever you want. You can delete a big part of it, or you can add your own questions. Um, this is entirely up to you. Always thinking, we do, we do not want to encourage people to change specific questions, because the questions was often uh, include several sub items. Uh, they have been tested. So if you start changing individual questions, uh, you can't be sure really that this is that this has the quality it, it initially had. We recommend that if you want to add any question, that's fine. If you want to throw out entire question, that's also fine. Just don't modify the existing questions, the wording and things like that, because uh, you lose a little bit of quality that's now part of this instrument. Thank you, Jörg. Um, Artus is asking an uh, interesting question. So if the if it is possible to adjust the game tool to measure other source of inequalities, for example, abuse of power in the organization hierarchy. So it is asking how specific it is on gender equality and inequality. Well, if it's a very specific type of uh, discrimination, abuse, situation, social phenomena, you can, you should add one specific measurement scale for that. 
Um, we have, you will also find on the GEAM website, we have reviewed literature on existing measurement scales regarding leadership, other types of, um, other types of uh, organizational culture. Um, we also reviewed older measurement scales, uh, neo-sexism, ambulance sexism scales, which are used uh, a lot in social psychology and which are very validated instruments and, and uh, they have a lot of history. So there's a lot of measurement instruments out there. And uh, some of them, as I said, are already implemented. They're not part of this GIAM core, which comes in from the start, but it's, it's usually not a problem to add this. You have to be a little bit careful in terms of course, uh, English is a base language, but anything you add and any language you want to use the survey in, you have to provide the translation for that because otherwise it stays empty the way it works now. Um, so yeah, but you, you can add any other uh, measurement scale that you think is, is good and valid and you, you just add it. It's always, it's always a little bit of um, a, play, um, a negotiation, right? Between if we use the same instrument, and this was our idea a little bit, it also creates comparability. So it creates a platform or an opportunity for exchanging your insights, your results with between organizations, you know, and 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 discuss uh, the results and the measures applied and things like that. So the more you change of the GAM, um, the less, let's say, is it then easy to compare with other organizations who might have done the similar survey. Okay, thank you very much. And about um, measuring, uh, let's say, all inequalities, there is a specific question on intersectionality from Kirsten, and which is uh, commenting that intersectionality requires extremely sensitive data. How can we make people feel safe to share the, this data or to do not make them uh, in, mm, yeah, mm, be, to become uh, yeah, invisible. Well, that, there, are, there are many issues involved here. I mean, um, Lime Survey itself has different, different settings, let's say, of anonymization. Um, if you use the strictest setting for the anonymization. Um, basically, it, it, it's, you can't tell who uh, sent this data. With the important qualification, it depends on the size of who responds, because it might be that in an organization of 100 people, you have uh, three women in uh, leadership positions. And so if there are three responses, you know more or less you know who is who. But there are no, um, let's say, easy solution to that. Um, all I can say is that you can control the settings up to a certain degree in Lime Survey, which data you collect and also communicate this to your respondents. And then it really, it's really up to you how you safely store this data and um, well protect it that you know nobody has unauthorized access to the raw data we i don't recommend sharing you know open signs uh, sharing the raw data matrix because uh, this is problematic in terms of disclosure control you know simply by age sex and a couple of other variables you can quite easily identify the people so you have to be sure to really keep this um, in a safe place Later on then, in terms of presenting and discussing the aggregated results, I think this then it, it's fine because, um, um, you know, you can't really draw the conclusion who, who are respondents if you present it in an aggregated way. But it's actually, we had experience uh, specifically uh, for, from different countries where it's a small research institute and how they should do it. And um, it was a little bit uh, tricky. So the recommendation was also then for these specific people who could easily be identified that they do not respond to this question. Indeed, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very important question and thank you for raising it. Um, okay, we are going 
to the end of our webinar, I will collect these three last questions that we have that are a bit more specific on the, the tool. So Athanasius is asking if there is a, time a timeline for the translation that are being carried out, especially for Greek. So when do you think it will be ready? And Christina is asking um, so about the entire questionnaire with also the two extra modules, how many questions totally and how long does it take to fill it? And lastly, what is the difference between version one and version two? Okay, let's start with the last question. Version one, version two, it's basically it's shorter, a lot shorter because we said it was too long. This goes then to answer the second question. The first question, I think there were 69 questions in the ver version one, and it took between minimum 40 minutes, but some people it took like an hour to respond. So this was really, really long. With the reduced version, I think we're now at uh, 59 or no, I'm not sure. I can't remember now exactly how many questions we are, but it's shorter. It's between 20 to 30 minutes, uh, the response time now. The Greek version, um, I hope it's gonna be ready in a month. It's probably safe to say a month or a little bit more. That's that's a timeline. I mean, you know, our project was supposed to end, end of April. Now we have a six months extension. And uh, actually we're, we're supposed to translate to four languages. And now with the feedback we get and um, a little bit, you know, with also the pandemic, we decided it's probably worth to invest a little bit more time and resources in this project. So we don't have now a fixed timeline, you know, where we would have to deliver this, but uh, until the end of the project, of course, is, which is now October, but um, so we're quite flexible, but I hope it's gonna be, well, a month, six weeks from now, I think, where we have uh, the Greek translation. Okay, thank you very much, Jörg, for your extensive answers. And uh, thank you also for this work and also to, to have decided to extend the translation. I think it is really worthy and a useful tool for all of us. I will now leave the floor to Maria San Giuliano to wrap up and close this webinar. Thank you, Natasha. I would also have a, maybe a small question, very practical one. Um, uh, what in terms of the uh, sustainability of the, of the tool uh, as it is uh, developed and uh, linked uh, in, in a funded project until when uh, you will be able to, um, uh, let's say, uh, provide assistance to individual RPOs uh, willing to customize it? Yeah, we're going to be providing assistance and, you know, the, the online platform until the end of our project, until October, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then we have to see the way it's set up now is that uh, actually it can run on any Lime survey platform. So you can export the questionnaire and you just need to import it then in another Lime survey platform and you can run it on your own servers or wherever uh, all the scripts and manuals that we did are also, you know, in a format that is shared, it's on GitHub and you can use it. And, and we hope this already helps. And to be honest, later on, we, we haven't really thought about this much more. I mean, um, running the servers are it's easy, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money, but the thing is then really the support. And I think most support actually is then needed uh, when it comes to the interpretation of the data. Because there's, you know, if you really want to take advantage of the game, you need basic notions of statistics, you know, that you can do some cross tabs and, uh, you know, some significance tests and things like that. And, and then really take a look, examine your data, explore it, maybe with a statistician at your side, you know, it, it's not, there's no easy formula for that. We really say, you know, this is, the data and now do this. No, you really need to make sense of it in the context of your organization. And um, I think we're, it's, it's also about exploring how something, how support in this lines could be set up. 
I think for us now, you know, generating a new account and and letting people customize it and everything, it's it's a it's a thing of uh, ten minutes maybe. But uh, I see the that the, the interpretation and really then turning the data into insights. Let's say for your gender equality plan. Uh, well, we start with this. I think now also with a webinar, and there's going to be another webinar then on an analysis, but. Um, I don't know, maybe through another project or tied to other projects that this should uh, continue. Yeah, right. Uh, that was also part, I think, of um, another question that I wanted to make and, and probably uh, something that also our participants had in mind. Uh, because in, indeed, you, you, um, the tool is going to facilitate institutions, um, maybe from STEM disciplines without, um, uh, let's say, a background in, in sociology, etc., and statistics in the initial phases, but then uh, the interpretation will still require this type of expertise. So uh, uh, either it is provided uh, through another project uh, or um, in, RPOs would need to really activate to find the internal um, uh, expertise for, for uh, approaching and, and tackling the, the interpretation phase, right? Yeah. yeah what, we do, what we do with, with Advanced Today, we develop currently a manual for the analysis. So we take artificially generated data with the questions from the, from, from the questionnaire and you know, present the code for doing the analysis, but also then the interpretation of that. So that at least, you know, there's some basic ideas of how such an interpretation could look like. But yeah. still, I think, uh, but this also might be, you know, a good way for reaching out to getting someone who is, I don't know, working in biostatistics or something, you know, say, you know, can you help me look at this data and draw them in, actually, in, in you know, in, in, in the gap design, so. No, yeah, really. I think we we really had um, a taste of uh, of how valuable and solid this this tool is, and uh, the fact that it's uh, open source, it's really it's really great, and uh, it can be really appropriated and customized by by institutions. So, um, for I would just conclude by by inviting all of all of our participants to. Uh, really consider joining um, and registering the, the, the forthcoming um, uh, webinars because uh, workshops, online workshops on, on, on the topic with you and your colleague, Jörg. Um, the, the key takeaway that I would stress is it was really um, your, your uh, um, reflection on the importance of uh, being able of uh, connecting um changes in perceptions from the staff with the uh, actions that uh, have been uh, implemented through the gender equality plans so and th this can really happen uh if you uh use uh, harmonized tools in the auditing phase and in the monitoring and evaluation phase such yeah. as uh, the dm um, tool of course so uh, thank you again um, and uh, I would uh, just uh, leave the floor to Vasya, unless you have any further uh, final remarks, Jörg. No, it's just, I mean, about the, about the seminar upcoming, it's basically, you know, a more extended introduction, what's involved, and then it's going to be, uh, you know, a walkthrough process of what you need to do to customize it, basically, and launch it. So it's... Thanks again. Vasya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Maria, Natasha, and of course, York for today's webinar. It was very insightful, and I think it was the very first step uh, for the um, follow-up workshops that we all mentioned today here. Uh, thank you very much. We have posted the link of the PM tool on uh, Twitter and on all our social media if you want to uh, know more about it. And uh, we'll see you very soon in, uh, hopefully, in other sessions of G Academy. Have a nice day. Thanks, everybody. Thank okay. you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>